So good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us for this uh, webinar about the Climate Compatible Growth Programme's Flexible Research Fund. Uh, I'm Jim Watson. I'm the research director of the CCG programme, as we call it for short. Um, and I'm just going to be talking you through the, the Flexible Research Fund. Also with me is uh, my deputy, uh, Steffi Hermer, um, also from the CCG programme working at the University of Oxford. Uh, Peter, you will have seen, for those of you who just joined from the start, uh, who has helped organise the webinar, so thanks to Peter for that. And there's a couple of other colleagues here as well who might be able to help answer some of the questions you might have uh, uh, once I've completed the, the presentation. Um, this is being recorded, as Peter just mentioned, so um, if any of your colleagues uh, wish to see the webinar and answers to questions, then of course they can go back to it. We will post that after the webinar, the recording. OK, so I'm just going to go through a, a relatively brief presentation just to give you all some background on CCG, but more importantly, this particular call, uh, its purpose and the main topics we're covering. Um, so I'll do that and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions as we're going along, please do put them in the in the chat um, and we'll get to them uh, at the end of the presentation, if that's all right. Um, and if you can all make you sure you keep yourself on, on mute, that'd be really helpful. I know most of you are already, so that's great. Thank you. So um, on to the next slide, if I can make it work. So the Climate Compatible Growth Programme, some of you might be familiar with us, but I'm not going to assume that you are. So this is a, a, a £38 million programme. It's quite a large uh, programme funded by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So that's the UK's Foreign Ministry and International Development Ministry uh, combined. It runs from 2021 to 2025. It's a, a research programme. Um, but also produces what we call global public goods. That's open source models, data, other sorts of tools. So there's a real emphasis on being able to use and access the data and tools and research uh, that the program produces. And that's equally important for anybody funded under the program, including through the Flexible Research Fund. I'd also emphasize that we're independent. We're not an arm of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We're a set of independent researchers working in UK universities and universities and organizations in other countries too. Um, so, you know, we're not part of the British government. We're funded by them, but we're independent. And our main rationale is to support, provide evidence to support investment in sustainable energy and transport systems to meet the development priorities of the global south. So, as it says there on the slides, so that's our key, if you like, driving factor and uh, and rationale. Uh, and I've already mentioned the last point. So we've got a number of UK leading research organisations involved, but also uh, some quite extensive partnerships now with local researchers in six specific countries. Uh, many of those are, are the subject of this call uh, with governments and with international organisations as well. So on to the fund itself. Um, we have four objectives of the fund. Um, so a program like this, which runs for you know four or five years, things are going to change, and that's uh, more true than ever right now. The number of changes that have happened since the program was first conceived are enormous, both globally and for many of the countries we're working with. So we need to be responsive to the research opportunities that uh, leads to, uh, and so therefore we've we've had this flexible research fund planned in from the start. We want to use it to expand our research capacity and our impacts. So there's only so much uh, the core consortium can do. And so we need to bring other people in. And that links to the third point about diversification. We're really interested in bringing in new institutions, new perspectives, new locations. So if you're, you know, the funding through the fund is not really designed for those people already involved in the core program, research program of CCG. It's trying to bring in uh, new voices, new institutions. And we have a really important emphasis because of the nature of our work on strengthening the role of low and middle income country researchers in the programme. So if you read the, the detail, at least 40 percent of the funding through this call and through the FRF more generally has to go through to researchers or institutions in low and middle income countries. We feel that's uh, really important for the effectiveness of the fund and for our programme as a whole. Another uh, few points on this particular uh, call. So this is the second call that we have. We've had one already and there's a number of projects now underway through that first call. So we've got some experience uh, of running it and have, have made some adjustments in the light of that. There are more calls planned in the future. 
Um, the really important thing is that the topics that you will see, the six topics which I'll go through briefly, they've been chosen not by us sitting in the UK, but through some really extensive collaboration and consultation with stakeholders in our priority countries, the countries where we work in, in detail. Um, also consult consultations with international organisations and with our funder FCDO as well, uh, both their local offices and their national office in the UK. And um, India, Lao PDR and Vietnam. Uh, we're also working in Kenya and Zambia, but those countries are the focus of a number of projects that were funded under the first call. So for this call, we're not focusing on those two countries this time. When you're making an application, you must focus on one of the topics. If you're interested in more than one topic, that's of course really uh, welcome, but uh, you need to do a separate application uh, for each of the topics in the call. Um, and I'll go through those in a moment. Successful applicants, we're not going to just give you the funding and then um, ask you what you did at the end. We're actually very keen to integrate you into the, uh, the programme as a whole, into the research work streams we already have and the structure we already have so that we maximise any synergies between projects that are funded through the call and with the other work that we are doing. Um, and all projects are really required, and this is emphasised in the call text, uh, to have a clear plan for working with stakeholders in those countries, particularly decision makers, but also to publish and disseminate their results, whether it's in uh, as outputs such as academic journal papers and policy briefings, but also the, the data and any kind of models and tools, um, you know, uh, making sure that they are open source and accessible in line with our general philosophy. And we have guidance on all of that as well. Um, eligibility, we always get a lot of questions about eligibility, who is allowed to apply. Uh, we try to keep it broad, but the real emphasis is on individuals and organisations engaged in independent research. That includes universities, of course, but we also recognise that that also covers think tanks, consultancies, some independent researchers in some countries are quite common. It doesn't include governments. Uh, we do get that question sometimes, so we're not uh, funding governments or government departments, uh, but obviously the researchers and the think tanks that those governments work with are really welcome to apply and of course they may want to partner with or have some relationship with a, an important government department uh, in as part of their research design. Um, we're interested in applicants from any uh, organisations in any part of the world but the proposals have to focus on the countries that we're specifying in each of the six topic areas. Um, we do welcome consortium applications. We've had those before. They're, they're not a problem, but we need a lead organisation and also a good explanation of how those organisations are going to work together, because I think that's a particular challenge, uh, especially when you've got a, a number of organisations there. I've already mentioned the next point, which is a minimum of 40 percent funding. This is across all of the projects. We'll have to go to researchers and or organisations in low and middle income countries. And I've mentioned the point at the bottom about government departments. We're also saying that companies are not eligible to apply, but individuals from those organisations could be part of teams led by an independent research organisation. So there's a little bit of flexibility there, but certainly companies and departments as in themselves are not eligible to apply for this. So I hope that's clear. So on to the topics. Uh, so this is the, I guess, the interesting bit for many of us researchers. What is it we actually want to fund work on? I think the thing to say before I go through them is we've, we've had a lot of ideas uh, pitched to us in our conversations um, with stakeholders in the countries uh, that the call focuses on uh, through conversations. So we've had to be very selective. We've only got a certain amount of money. Um, and uh, therefore we've been selective about which topics we've chosen uh, and to try and get a spread of topics across a spread of countries. So we won't have been able to include all the ideas by any means that we had, and some of them may well be used in future calls. So the first one, green hydrogen in India, um, uh, we've said we'd fund one or two projects. There's clearly a, a lot of interest in green hydrogen broadly across many of our countries, but in India in particular, given the country's green hydrogen mission, there's a particular focus, and you'll see that in the call text, on state level activity and, and, and local activity rather than looking at the broad national activity or national hydrogen picture in, in, in India. Um, and that was really in line with some of the, uh, the ideas that we got through our consultations. Um, so yes, it's putting India into that global context of demand for hydrogen, but actually focusing down on some rather more specific opportunities. 
The second one is energy efficiency and allow PDR. We'll probably fund one project under that call. Um, uh, and that one, you know, again, we've got a wide range of ideas there, uh, particular emphasis on assess assessing the potential for energy efficiency savings, uh, both in industrial sectors and residential sectors, but also analyzing the bar barriers to adoption of energy efficiency uh, and evaluation of feasibility and impact. All of these ideas came up and we've combined them into a, a single call with a number of topics and questions. Uh, we're given some flexibility on this one for proposals to focus on one or more of the three areas that are specified in the call, so you don't have to cover everything. So do read the uh, guidance carefully, and that goes for a number of the, of the other topics too. The third one is macroeconomic implications of transitions to low carbon energy in Vietnam. Uh, again, a number of ideas in that theme, so we've, we've brought them together. Uh, because it's quite a broad theme, uh, we've included the idea that we might fund two projects rather than just one on that theme because it is it is quite a diverse theme so again there are three specific areas outlined in the call documentation uh, the first one is economy wide you know what are the implications of the green transition for macroeconomic uh, indicators and uh, the state of the economy but then the second and third go into more specific issues the sectoral impacts of the energy transition and then the socio-economic impacts of the shift away from coal in the power sector so we maybe envisage that you know we might have a project that's broader and then another one that's more focused but uh, as i said there's it, it it is really up to applicants to uh, decide what they want to focus on in line with the guidance we've given um, and the fourth one on this slide um, is climate change and low carbon transport in Vietnam. So another Vietnam focused one. Um, our transport team is active in many countries, but we've tried to focus on a country where they haven't done as much work yet. Um, again, that's a fairly broad one. Um, uh, but we've said for this in this case just one project it's really looking at what the potential existing roadmaps are for reducing emissions from the transport sector and then a real focus because again that's what people asked for when we consulted them an emphasis on the costs and benefits of measures to reduce emissions from transport sector and the link to policy and regulatory change so those are the first four i've got another slide with the fifth and the sixth so to Ghana now, the financing the energy transition in Ghana is our fifth topic. We're going to do at least one project. We may do more than one, depending on um, what uh, bids we get and, and how the budget looks. Um, so we may just fund one, but we may fund more than one. Again, there are some specific sets of questions to focus on. Um, tends to be quite broad about um, barriers to financing a transition to clean, affordable energy. So it's looking very much at the energy sector is this one interest in public and private finance and uh, uh, both national and international clearly the context in ghana is a recent debt default and the imf restructuring that country is going through so that makes you know financing uh, clean energy more challenging than it was and then maybe some research looking at more specific funding schemes and uh, say one of our consultees suggested the district assembly's common fund but there may be other funding schemes in ghana that uh, could be used for financing clean energy so again there's a there's a number of questions there uh, read them carefully and and again decide which ones you wish to respond to and then last but not least, uh, the sixth topic cuts across two different countries, Vietnam and, and Lao PDR. We had uh, similar sort of conversations and, and requests for both of those countries on cooling, a really important issue for many, many countries, but those countries in particular. So in that case, that's why we're saying up to two projects, because we probably envisage different projects focusing on uh, Vietnam and then on Lao PDR. Um, and um, a number of, of questions again, rather like one of the transport topics earlier um what should a national roadmap for sustainable cooling look like is one of the questions we're looking at um and then a focus on national supply chains because again that was the focus of a number of the requests we received um how can those supply chains be developed within those countries and what's the relationship between that and international supply chains but also um a focus on policies and regulations too um and we're saying that any proposal focusing on one of those countries should cover at least two of those areas that we've specified. So that's a very quick uh, go through the uh, topics. Um, just to finish off a few things, um, a pre few more practical considerations. Again, all of this is in the uh, the documentation on the website uh, with, with the call publication. 
So first on, you know, how will the um, uh, the uh, proposals be assessed? So these are our criteria, five of them. We are going to look at research design and methodology, uh, making sure that that makes sense, uh, that it's appropriate for the budget and uh, and for the questions that are being asked. Alignment with the call, that's very important. So make sure that whatever you uh, propose is aligned with the call. I'm sure there are many, many other questions you could ask and explore, but uh, we're very keen to make sure that alignment with the call is there. Um, the pathways to impact on decision making, I've mentioned that already. So the links with stakeholders, the links with decision makers is very important to us in general. Um, have you got the right partnerships and applicants in there? Do they have the right skills, the right capabilities? Are they, you know, have they got good arrangements to manage if it's a consortium um, of, of two or more organisations? And then the finance and value for money is important too as well. So all of the proposals are going to be independently peer reviewed. So we'll send those out to independent peer review, peer reviews from outside our consortium, and then there will be a, a panel uh, to make decisions, including members of our um, advisory board at CCG. And then finally, some uh, key dates. Um, I think you have them again in the documentation. So uh, the call opened just a week ago. We've got the webinar today. The application deadline is uh, roughly four weeks away, mid-September, the 14th of September. Do note the time um, and the time zone as well uh, for getting applications in. And then we, because of the review process and the panel meeting, it will take us a few weeks to make decisions and let applicants know. And then after that, there's a process of due diligence before and contract negotiation before work can start. So that, I think, is everything I wanted to say. I hope that came across clearly. I'll just stop sharing my slides so I can see everybody. Um, and then we'll head to questions. Sorry, my screen's just uh, updating, so I can't really see anything. OK, so um, I'm just going to check the chat. Yes, yeah, um, so lots of questions in there, Jim, waiting for you. So uh, take your time to. I, will. I think one or two of them one or two of them got answered as you went through, but there's still some outstanding ones. Thank you. So um, forgive me, I will just go from the top and if anything's been answered further down. Um, just uh, maybe Steffi or Peter, you can just let me know. But I was going to start with the one from about the team of researchers from different organisations and yeah, how many. That's fine, go ahead. Yeah. You haven't answered that. So there isn't really a maximum number. I think it's the the main thing is ensuring that, you know, people in your team have a, an important role. Uh, there's a real rationale for including those people in there rather than just including lots of people because it might make the proposal look better or, you know, it might make it look like you've got the right experts in there. So, you know, making sure you have the role and that emphasis on value for money. You know, what are the what are the different team members adding, the different organisations adding to the proposal? So. So I think uh, that's yeah, but we don't really have a limit on on numbers. Uh, so the next ones, sorry, I'm just reading because it's a bit longer about the private research organisation with the educational institute. Uh, time and scope and maximum grant funding, all of those things are specified. So for each topic, I haven't gone through it in detail when I've run through the topics. For each topic, we've specified a, a maximum either for the topic as a whole or for each project. We've given a suggested range for time scale as well. So we're not going to say to people, you have to take 12 months. Sometimes we've said between 12 and 18 because we recognise, you know, people will want some flexibility to design their research and we don't want to over specify. So then, but the maximum money available is is, is specified in each case. Um, yes, a, a work plan is is part of a, a good proposal um, in terms of something like a Gantt chart that just says here are the work packages, the sequencing, the timing of things, and do that by it, along with the proposal. Uh, clearly, those things can be developed in more detail if you're successful, but certainly a, a high level work plan is really really welcome as part of it as well. Um, on the ground pilots, I think that personally, I don't know if others have views uh, in, in the CCG team, but I think on the ground pilots are difficult in the given the amount of money we've got. You know, we're a research organisation. Um, it's, it, I think it's quite difficult to do kind of technical. If you're talking about technical demonstration pilots within the within the uh, amount, so so I think. Hopefully hello, hello. Yeah. 
I hope not getting it. Could you mute, mute yourself or maybe Peter could mute whoever it is that's just having a parallel conversation there. That's all right. Thank you. Um, the question about cooling project in Vietnam, I have not seen the project on cooling in Vietnam. That's OK, Jim. We've, we answered that one. You've answered that one. Fantastic. Thank you. It is on the next page. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Fund disbursement mechanism and the selection criteria. Well, the selection criteria we've certainly gone through. Is there anything else any colleagues want to say on the fund disbursement mechanism, how it actually works? Because we haven't gone through all of that in detail. So, um, I'm quite sure on what the question is referring to. Is that referring to how we're going to pay, as in the percentage share, or is it more on to do with? allocation of how we're making the decision. Maybe the person that asked that question could elaborate on what they meant unless someone else is understanding it. Yeah, I think it might be just how it's worked in terms of the scheduling of payments and that sort of thing, um, which I know we have a you know pretty good system for. Is there anything you can say about that or maybe Michael could? Well, I think Michael is on the call. Michael, do you want yeah, to come in? I can Not say I can. OK, great. OK, yeah, I, I read it the same way, Jim. So in terms of payments, we once contracted, we generally start with 30 percent payment up front to, to get the uh, recognising funds are important to build a team, bring it together. However, it, there is a, it's a, a grant which flows down through us. So there are grant disbursements forms which need to be filled at the end. So we need a uh, evidence of where the money spent and times, etc. But the first one, first thirty percent at the start of the project, the, the the following payments will be split upon the deliverables. When the deliverables become ready, we'll review those. They've signed off, and then the payment structure will be uh, will vary by contracts uh, because obviously each project will have uh, different time schedules to deliver. But I think the key factor there is 30% at the beginning of the project. Hope that helps. I think you're on mute, Jim. Sorry. Um, thank you, Michael. I just said that. I hope that answers the question. Um, so I'll move on to for the cooling project in Vietnam, which subtopic is the focus? I hopefully I've covered that at least very briefly. I but again, if, if, if you look at the grant specification, it's it's in there. I copied Sorry. them in as well as a reply. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I think you've answered the next one, Jim. How many in the group? Uh, yeah, the, for groups. Hopefully, the um, the question of uh, about groups has 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 heard the answer from earlier. So I think that one. Yeah. Specific proposal format. Have you answered that one? Um, anybody? No. Well, there is a a f like a form on what you need to fill in. So the form is provided in um, the application package. So I recommend yeah. people to look at that. That's right. We do have a very, you know, it's a standard template form. It's downloadable from the from the from the web page. Uh, and so there's a structure we require you to follow, including for budget information and other things. Uh, so the cooling one you've done. Uh, how it is dispersed. I hope Michael just covered that. Yeah. So yes, there's a question about the minimum of 40% of funding will be directed to researchers or organisations in low middle income countries. So that's that's a good clarification. It doesn't necessarily apply to the lead researcher of the team, but to be honest, I think we we would really particularly welcome it if the lead researcher in a team is from a low middle income country or from you know the country, uh, whether it's the country that we've specified. Uh, that, the, that the research should be on, you know, so if it's about transport in Vietnam, having a Vietnam led team would make sense. So we'd welcome that, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't necessarily have to be. So we're looking at the makeup of the team, the makeup of the project overall. Um, and so you could have a lead from another country, you know, uh, from, I don't know, Germany, for example, but then you'd really want to show how the team as a whole is going to have insufficient involvement for, of researchers and organisations from low middle income countries. So, you know, that that is flexible. 
yeah, we've had um, applicants from different organisations in different countries uh, applicable. I think we've answered that. Hopefully. Um, how many grants will be funded this round? Well, I think hopefully if you can, if you go through the topics and the individual uh, specifications each time we've said, sometimes we've said we'll fund one project on a topic, sometimes two, sometimes we've said at least one. So the number that we will eventually fund is not entirely clear because it kind of depends on the quality. But sometimes we've been very clear that if we get uh, it, good enough proposals, that we will fund say one or two or sometimes we'll fund more than one. The only other thing I'd say is that and it happened on one topic last time is that if we don't get sufficiently uh, high quality proposals that meet the criteria, we sometimes don't fund anything. So it's not that we have to fund something under each topic. We'd obviously like to, but it really depends on on who responds and the and the proposals and whether they meet our criteria. Um, is it mandatory that the data the researchers use to address the research must be freely accessed by the end of the project? I, I think so, but um, as I said, we do have some quite more detailed guidelines on data, and I don't know if Steffi or another colleague wish to say anything else about that, because and um, whether that's something we can make available. Um, I guess uh, maybe important here is that we would like it to be publicly available, but if there is reasons why it cannot be, then obviously we can consider those and take them into account. But generally, CCG operates on an open source, um, under op open source principles. So we'd like to make everything publicly available at the end of the projects. Yeah, that's a good answer. Thank you. Um, so I think I've reached the end of what's written now. I can see somebody uh, somebody's typing or at least two people are typing. So um, we'll just pause for a minute while there are other things. And Peter, maybe is there anything else you wanted to pass on? Yes, I just wanted to ask a question, Jim, and, and if, if no is the answer, that's fine. Is there obviously so the video of this, including these questions and the transcript of this will be available on our YouTube channel as quickly as we can after this. Is there any opportunity for people to, to ask questions in between times that may not be covered in the video, are they able to email anybody to ask clarification questions before the September deadline? Uh, yes, yes, I think they are. I think the question is just the best uh, route to that. I mean, at the moment, you know, you're there as the contact Peter for the webinar itself, so they could come in by you. Um, that might be if, if you're happy uh, to be the conduit for that. But absolutely, if people have questions we haven't covered. Then, right, then please do ask and we'll do our best. Um, I just encourage people to check the um, frequently asked questions document first, just to make sure that we haven't answered it somewhere already. Thanks Thank so much, you. Jim. So I've got a few more um, come in. So, oh, the typo. Yeah, thanks, 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 Steffi, for responding already. And apologies for that. Um, I, I think I know what it's referring to and we, we will correct it. Um, uh, make sure that's sorted out. So thank you uh, for, for picking that up for us. Do we need to apply through the university system? We, yes, you do. You do need to apply using, I mean, again, read the instructions on the web, web page. There's a, um, a Word document that's there that is to fill in and it gives quite clear instructions on how to apply. So you need to use that system to apply if you want to be considered. Um, is the proposal academic oriented or practical oriented? That's actually quite a good question because although we are very focused on research, it is practical in the sense that we're interested in doing research or commissioning research that has a practical implication. So it's research that's informing decision making, but it doesn't mean that you know the academic part is downgraded because of that. We really want high quality research with good clear methodologies that uses good data, that draws conclusions based on evidence. All of those things apply to CCG in this fund. But clearly we do want a practical outcome. We don't want it to be just, you know, nice research for the sake of it. We want it to be research that's useful for decision makers in, in the country concerned. So I hope I hope that helps to answer that. Um, a question about um, if needed, um, if 
you need government acceptance. I think I'm interpreting that correctly uh, to uh, for, for to have a project. I mean, you don't necessarily have to have a kind of official endorsement, if you like, of your application. But clearly it does help a lot if you can demonstrate that you've discussed it with relevant ministries, if it's uh, a, a project that uh, would be helping to inform their work uh, and their decisions. Uh, and you can demonstrate that by, you know, listing partners and talking a bit about how you're going to work with them. I think that would help a lot in, to, in, in, in your application. So you don't necessarily have to have acceptance of government, but uh, demonstrating that link and the relationship is, is quite important. Uh, got the link. Successful projects in the past to share. That's a that's another good question. I'm not sure how much information we have publicly available on the projects that are ongoing. I know there are plans to share details, but maybe Peter or Steffi, maybe Peter, do, do you know? In terms of plans, we probably may not have um, a lot of detail on on the first round projects at the moment. No, I don't think we do. I mean, um, if people don't follow us on LinkedIn already, I would advise them to follow us on LinkedIn. That's where the richest amount of information about what we're doing comes, yeah. including the publication of reports or uh, journals or whatever it is that we've done or we've funded. So the most recent yeah. things are there rather than on our, on our website, which is a project that is being rebuilt at the moment. So yeah. I think that's the best place to go is uh, LinkedIn because we post everything on there that is that is current or forthcoming. Yeah, great. Thank you, Peter. That's good advice. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I would also add that the first round projects are still in progress, so they're, yeah. they've not come to completion yet. So uh, when they do, I'm sure there will be more information, but they're not due to complete yet. Mm. But I think even with our website, we revamp, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we've got plans at least to say what the projects are about, you know, a bit a summary of each one and that kind of thing, which most programmes like ours would do. So, uh, yeah, apologies to all that they're not available now, but it's because we're going through a website refresh process at the moment. Um, the LinkedIn link, if Peter, you could put that in. Um, Done. Thank you. Um, so there's a question about a private consultancy. Could it apply to LEED? I think that's definitely yes. If it's a you know private consultancy that does research and is independent, absolutely you could apply as the LEED and then you could have an educational institute like a university as a partner. Or you could, you know, if you are a consultancy or a think tank um, and you feel you've got all of the capabilities required to do a project, to deliver it successfully, then, um, you know, a partnership isn't necessary. Um, so again, we're flexible um, on that. But you certainly don't need to be a university or uh, an educational institution to lead a project. OK. Colleagues, anything else for now? Well, uh, I can see Peter typing, but I can't see any of those coming up. I will pause for a little while just in case there are other questions. I know some people uh, arrived a little late and they might have uh, further questions to ask. So there's please indicate the proposal format here. Again, uh, just uh, apologies for the repeat. And I think the link was put further up. So there is a, a form. Um, it's a Word, Microsoft Word document, which is on the web page um, with all the details. Um, I think if you go down fairly towards the bottom, it's called application form and there's a link uh, to the Word file. So if you download that file, um, it can just give you a good idea of the format of the proposal. You know, what are the boxes you need to fill in? Uh, what is the structure of the budget? All that sort of thing. So hopefully it's self-explanatory, uh, but do let us know if there, you, there are any problems accessing any of the documentation, of course. Thank you. I think that's, I think that's everybody's questions, Jim, as far as I can tell. It is, yeah. So. I think unless I see anybody typing, um, I think we will perhaps draw it to a close there. I'll just give colleagues a, a, a last chance to come in with any final points if you wish, but otherwise I think we'll draw things to a close. OK, just to, to reinforce your point earlier, Jim, uh, there is a, a frequently asked question. So any questions you have, go there first. They're probably already answered. Yeah, 
yeah, I think some of them certainly have been. Yeah. Thank you. OK, well, thank you again all for joining and for your interest in the call. And I, I hope you're feeling motivated to uh, send in uh, some really great proposals. We're really looking forward to seeing, you know, which proposals come in. And um, and obviously, as we've explained, we'll go through a review process and uh, and we'll be in touch in due course and, and do get in touch if you've got any other questions.